On this edition of Check 6 Aviation, we're going to take the most expensive free airplane ride and we're also going to take a tour of Vans Aircraft. All right, it is Oregon, and we are here inside Vans Aircraft in one of their massive store you know, warehouses for lots of parts. And I'm here with Sterling, and uh, we're we're gonna go tour this 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 wonderful place of aviation heaven. All right. So the first area here, basically, what we're walking through is just all parts inventory pieces, parts for different airplanes. You can see. Uh, you know, a lot of the part numbers, this is mostly RV7 stuff here. You can see by the part numbers, some of the components, like this is a A403, that technically is a RV4 part number, but the aileron for the four, the seven, and the eight are basically a universal part. So some of the four parts are used in later, later models. And there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, we try and reuse if uh, rather than redesign the wheel, just use the same wheel. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So now I, like I was saying that I've got a, uh, a ten, uh, an RV10 empennage kit on order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, it's got, probably going to be. Uh, you've got another RV10 production run coming up. Uh, I don't follow the the production runs that closely. I guess um, you know we're constantly cycling through different production runs for you know seven wings, and then they'll jump onto a you know ten fuselage, and then a you know, 14 finishing kit type of thing. So okay. we're constantly just rolling through different production runs, trying to trying to keep parts on the shelves. Right on, right on. And you, I, I think I saw something along, along the lines of you've got about 5,000 RVs flying in the U.S. currently. Uh, geez, I'm not sure what the actual U.S. number. There's over 10,000 flying RVs out there. I would assume the the large number of that is in the u.s well that's a lot of grinning right there yeah yeah definitely uh, but yeah i want to say geez we passed 10,000 flying aircraft well, probably three years ago um, i'd have to look at the website see what it is now it could be uh, could be up to 11 by now so we got some wiring harnesses here all, all cool stuff ah the big daddies. So we've got what the gals are working on over there is an RV, looks like an RV7 wing kit going together. You can see the long crate there obviously is for the wing spars. And we take advantage of the length of that crate and put in some long angles for the, the actual fuselage. Longerons go into that crate as well. Um, and then a few other long angles that we send just because it's convenient. Um, they'll be cut up and used for the uh, fuselage construction. But, um, and then you can see stacks of wing ribs, wing tips, skins will be pulled soon. Now for the people who go with like the add-ons, like say the zip tips, they can go ahead and order their wing kit without the tips over there you can so we'll we'll allow customers to basically piecemeal things you know you can delete certain items out of kits hardware bags are just it's a big unit of, of hardware we don't really allow deletions of that anymore it's just too time consuming um, but large items like wing tips or if you want to delete some of the wing ribs yeah I mean you can give us a part number of what you don't want and we'll take them out of the kit that's no problem sweet um and then you know there's a there's a fair as you know with the zip tips and, and many other items there's a pretty good following of aftermarket things out there that mm -hmm. some guys prefer um, easy enough to delete our part and, and get the uh, aftermarket part yourself uh, we're kind of in uh, a restructuring here it's a bit of a mess because we're moving shelving around putting new shelves in different areas and, 
a lot of the parts you see back in this area are finishing kit items from cowlings to engine mounts and wheels, brakes, tires, inner tubes. You can see some of the canopies are sitting right here. This is uh, all those are already 12 canopies. The canopies and the fiberglass are two major items that we don't build in-house. The, the canopies are done by a company, Airplane Plastics, over in Tip City, Ohio. And our, most of our fiberglass is done by M&W Composites in Dundee, Oregon. Okay. Um, those are two items that we just willingly admit we don't have the expertise to build ourselves, and we're happy to let the experts take care of those. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, now, most of the sheet metal, like all the blue parts you see on these shells, just about everything you see with the blue vinyl, well actually everything you see with the blue vinyl would be manufactured right here in this building. We can get to that a little bit. I would imagine you're also making room for the RB15 parts once they become... Uh, I, I think we're still a little ways out from needing to make shelf space. For <laughs> but uh, yeah, eventually we're going to have to do that. This is where it's actually kind of, uh, again, under development. This is where we're going to start creating up our quick build kits. We're just needing to expand our, our creating department a little bit. So. I understand you're also looking into uh, expanding to um, South America for uh, outsourcing your quick builds. Yeah, so they've been talking about with a company in Brazil that's going to start building quick builds. Um, that's. You know, I, I don't think they've actually gotten any components down there yet, but that's one of the things they're they're looking at. We have, a, we have a couple of companies down in Brazil that have been building our kits for a number of years, and, and basically they're allowed to build and, and sell, you know, if they build an RV-10, they can sell it essentially like a certified aircraft here. The rules are, are far different than they are here in the States. So mm. they've been, uh, you know, we've had a, couple of companies that have been buying kits for years in fairly good quantities and building them and selling them down there. Wow. So they're, uh, they obviously have the, uh, the skill set and the expertise to, you know, do quick builds. And here's a few of the quick builds. Yeah, you can see on the shelves, quick build rings and quick build fuselages. We've got a few standing up right vertically here. And of course, they're, they're done just enough to where it still satisfies the 51%. Yeah, some kits more than others, you know, some kits leave a fair bit of leeway, and some of them are very close to that 51% line. Um, I think the, uh, I was told a story one time when the FAA came and assessed the RV-8 kit. They were fine with the RV-8A fuselage, but the RV-8 fuselage, they decided we did too much. So they told us to take out, you know, half a dozen screws and pull out one panel, so. And then it was okay. I have no idea if that was true or not, but that was a good story, I thought. Sounds like you were just over that 51% line. Just over that line. And then we've got a bunch of kits that are ready to go out. Lots of, lots of crates waiting to be stuffed in a container and sent. Uh, RV-10F? No. Darn. <laughs> yeah, it's a little small for that, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I was just looking to see... Uh, this is going to Sweden. Sweden, nice. Yeah. So, the, I think I got a little bit of the address off to blur that out. Yeah. got a stack of engine mounts here that are being prepared to send out to powder coating and a few other smaller weldments you can see. Uh, we do a lot of the welding in-house. Again, not all of it. There's a, there's a fair bit of welding that we do still job out, but this is a small bracket. This is actually for the uh, canopy gas strut for the RV-10. This mounts to the inside of the cabin top. Actually, uh, this piece would mount just right under here. And uh, well, this gets cut away a bit for the, uh, the installation, but gets mounted underneath that, and then the gas strut would attach to it okay. for, the, for the door actually. So, if a builder knows what color that they're going, you know, they're, they're, they want to change a color, you know, they've got a color scheme in mind for their airplane, can they tell you what color I, they want, or you, is it all just 
powder you can get any white. color you want as long as it matches the color we're powder coating them that day okay so uh if you need a if you need it to be another color the powder coating can be scuff sanded and, and painted whatever color you'd like it to be but for a moment there i thought you were going to be like henry ford and say you can, you can have yeah. any color you want as long as it's, as long black. As it's black well our powder coating is white so that doesn't work either <laughs> Kind of a kind of a light gray color but yeah there is no no custom option on that um, if you're if you're willing to wait a little bit and want to basically order a non powder coated item we can we can arrange to pull a part out of a production run before it gets powder coated but typically that you know you'd have to wait for the next cycle of parts for that it doesn't uh, doesn't happen you know on a short timeline typically right so what's the yeah the amount of hours that it would take a builder to put together an airplane like say for example I'm, uh, I've got the RV 10 coming uh, I've heard something like about 2,500 hours so the average kit if you follow our plans and don't get into the aftermarket stuff you're probably looking around 2200 hours for a standard kit rv10 uh, and you know some guys might build it in less than that and some guys are are going to take more time um, now i've had reports from builders that say you know they've got 3500 hours and and still going on their rv10s but they're getting into all the aftermarket stuff like the air conditioning units and oxygen systems overhead consoles um, you know there's as, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of aftermarket parts that have been designed for the RV-10. I'm just starting to figure that out. <laughs> now, something like an RV-14, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of items that have been designed yet to be added to that type of build. And it's pretty well set in stone on that model. Um, everything's so defined as far as rivet locations, bolt locations. Uh, parts being cut to final size that you know it's basically just a an assembly process um, rv14 builders are getting airplanes in the air and you know about 1600 hours from standard kits and if you add a you know the quick build components to that they can get them down to about a thousand man hours wow uh, sevens and eights you know the older kits seven eights nine they're about a 2,000 hour build, uh, maybe 1,200 from a quick build. Well, 789s, they're about an 1,800 hour build, realistically. Okay. Cool. Huh? CNC? I've seen videos of this in action yeah. on your YouTube channel as well. Looks like You're being doing, a. Uh, doing spar bars right now, you can see a couple of the bars. Finished here, sitting here. I think he's, uh, I assume he's getting ready to remove those. They look finished. Spar bars, okay. So this is kind of an interesting item here. We've, uh, this is a heat treat fixture for the RV-12 nose gear leg. Um, I remember the first heat treat fixture we built was made from eighth inch plate steel, and it has just slowly grown over time, trying to get a heat treat fixture that would last more than you know eight or 10 parts. Right. Um, they're, these ones, this is the latest rendition. It's all bolted together, CNC machined, obviously, and pretty, uh, pretty stout piece of uh, steel. We've, uh, we've gone through a few different versions of that fixture, trying to get one that would last the test of time. So the production shop, it used to be before these machines, the hoses were, were introduced. This was kind of the low tech end of things. And slowly as we went that way, it got higher tech as we went. With a lot of the older kits, we've still got the 12 foot shear. RV4s, 3s, 4s, and 6s. There's a lot of parts that we just cut out by hand still. We get our ring skins and juice skins. And, you know, we just mark them with a Sharpie off the template and cut them out by hand. 
most of the other airplanes, obviously, they're all CNC machined with the pre-punched holes that can't really form those parts. Like that. This is all stacks of spar bars that have come back from the anodizing and ready for ribbing. All right. So, what's the the benefits or purposes of an, of anodizing versus? Uh, it's mainly just a production. Um, having having a pallet of parts anodized is is much quicker for, as far as manpower than priming each individual part. Okay, like so at home. so anodizing is just basically corrosion control. Yeah, yeah, it's the same as priming the parts. Okay, just a different process, chemical process instead of applying a you know primer to it. It's, it's purely for corrosion protection. It serves no other purpose. We don't have any of them running right now, but we've got three press brakes where we do all of our straight line bending. We've got a pallet of parts down here. Uh, nothing, nothing real exciting to look at. These are all fairly simple components, but you can see just a. Uh, more or less a simple channel. This is a reinforcing doubler that goes inside of the nailer on, I believe. But uh, you can see this is the flat part. And then once it's bent up, it'll get separated into four pieces. And uh, that's the part. Parts on parts on parts. All right, so what's next? This is part of the, uh, the canopy frame, a little bracket that goes on the canopy frame of an RB14. Nice. And here's some examples of the tool I just used. This is just a, this is, this tool actually has, <coughs> excuse me, this tool has four different radiuses in it. So if we're doing like an eight inch circle or a eight inch, six inch, four inch, five inch, you know, it has four different sizes 
and it would use one edge to create a, a full circle and just rotate as it cuts around. So that's kind of a unique tool there. So it doesn't use the, it's not like a, a punch where it goes right through. It does, it goes right through. Oh, but okay. to do a large circle that's over three inches in diameter, it's gonna do one solid punch and then it's gonna, for whatever radius it's doing, it's gonna continue around using yeah. using just that edge okay. to complete the full circle. Well, I'm just gonna leave that there. <laughs> You know, different sizes of round holes, some of the different colors, like this is just kind of an oblong slot. Again, a square rect or a rectangle. Just all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Little square. This is kind of a odd shape that would be used to put a radius on the corner of a part. Okay. And everything's got grease all over it. Right. That looks like a little tool oil on your hands. Keeps them soft. Now well, let's go around this direction and we'll head out the So when we do a production run of components, Whatever the part may be, there's a master template that lives somewhere on this racking. And you know, whenever they, for this part here, whenever a production run is done, they'll grab that, Clico it onto the parts they're punching today, or whatever day they're doing it. And it has to match that template, otherwise the part's rejected. You know, they check the perimeter, hole diameters, uh, hole placement, and everything has to match. With the with the the, ex, the use of a lot of the technology that you guys have, what yeah, what's your reject rate like? So the reject rate's pretty low. Um, it's usually those those parts are typically it's it's kind of a first quality check. The first parts off the machine are going to indicate whether or not the program was written properly, whether the proper tools were loaded, that type of stuff. And once we've ensured that the first production parts coming off that day match the template, the rest of them are all pretty much going to be the same. The only thing that would really mess it up after that point is, is if a, a sheet somehow gets caught and wads up on the machine as it's moving around. Right. And that's pretty rare. Sometimes in the summertime, you know, if we have a, a warm day, we'll have the, the big doors open the breeze blows through and sometimes it's actually enough to lift the sheet off of the bed of the machine and it can cause it to catch on the machine while it's running. But it uh, makes, a, makes a heck of a racket, but uh, you know. It's one of those instances where you know you have a, an oops right away. Oh yeah, yeah. It's usually not a, a small difference. It's usually a, it's either all or nothing. I think I found my new home. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> Yep. <laughs> okay, so this is the nine, the 12 IS. The IS is the light sport version. Well, all the RB12s are the light sport. The IS is using the Rotax 912 IS. Uh, fuel injected engine. Okay. The original RB12 when we came out with it, uh, the ULS engine was the only thing that was available. So this plane got a pretty major facelift when we started using the uh, fuel injected. Are you after one of these?
Shout out to Mike Patey for the best tugs. by the sign on the wall that this was the one week wonder of 2019 this or 2018 is, rather. That, no? That sign was made before the one week wonder was built. Yeah, that was up while it was being yeah. built. Okay. Yeah, so the, the aircraft was being built with that sign in the background. That is the aircraft in the sign. The one week wonder has a pretty good job. Uh, ah. Here's my baby, right here. I'm gonna have a little bit of a uh, vastly different paint scheme, but this is the one I'm building. Boom. All right, so what kind of a performance numbers are we looking at for like some of the, like the, the RV time? So cruise flight in this airplane, I would, I usually, flight plan at 170 um, you know it'll go faster if you're willing to burn more um, fuel burn is usually 11 and a half 12 gallons an hour um, with a, a reasonable cruise um, takeoff performance you know light by myself I can get this aircraft off the ground in 300 feet when you go to full gross you know the the runway distance goes up to probably close to a thousand I, I don't know the the exact distance for full gross weight, but uh, definitely a bit higher than 300 feet. Um, so, yeah, someone like me who's close to 300 pounds with, you know, my wife who's about maybe a buck and a quarter, maybe buck 50, and two young girls, no problem at all. Oh, no. If you build the aircraft light, obviously, if you put a lot of stuff in it, like air conditioning and VRS and that type of the aftermarket stuff world, I guess, you know, you can you can chisel away at your uh, useful load pretty good. But uh, if you build it modest, like our plans show, um, you'll have a about a 1,200 pound useful load, which for most of us, four people and and some baggage is is doable. Yeah, and I, I've even heard that you can even. Uh, modify it to have like a, a, a third seat in the, in the rear? Uh, basically what I've heard of people doing there, I've never actually seen one but I've discussed it with folks, uh, is basically putting in a bench seat in the back instead of the kind of the captain's chairs that are there now. Um, there's kind of two individual seats in the back seat and if you did a bench seat and put in a third safety harness, yeah you could have a you know three smaller kids back there I, I think pretty easily okay cool yeah because uh, I know yeah my my, my uh, eldest best friend would love to go up in this and I'd yeah. love I'd just love to be able to take the family to wherever and have someone come along for the ride yeah yeah that'd be great all right so what's next this is uh, that's kind of the tour you know ending back here in the hangar and you can see if it's going to be available well Part, yeah, I'm a, I'm a professional driver by trade. Oh, okay. So, yeah, my truck's on the other side of the building. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, and so one of the, the advantages that I have over a lot of the other builders is if I have an oops, when I have an oops and I yeah. need another part, I just get a load up here. You'll be passing through, yeah. So, unfortunately, uh, I was hoping that I'd be able to go and experience the RV grin, but uh, he said it's just coming out of maintenance, so it's not quite ready, so. No flight today, unfortunately. Oops. But, uh, oh, um, one other thing. 
Yeah, you've been working on getting uh, your uh, the RV10 up to final size hole. Yes. Um, we, it, for for those who who are just looking into the uh, the possibility of building an airplane, explain to what that is. So. The RV-10, when it was originally designed, all of the holes in that aircraft were pre-punched, but they were undersized. It required the builder run a drill bit, a ream, something through the hole to get it to final size for the given fastener, whether it be a bolt or rivet. Um, they had to, everything had to be upsized. Most rivet holes only needed to be upsized by a few thousands, you know, three or four thousand at the most. Um, but it wasn't quite big enough just to get a rivet in the hole. Uh, what we've done, the RV-12 was the first aircraft that we had full-size holes, and then the RV-14 was developed with full-size holes as well. Um, one of the advantages, not necessarily advantages, but one of the reasons why, we got a helicopter down there, one of the reasons why the kits were designed with undersized holes was because you physically ran a drill bit through the hole, the FAA gave you credit for drilling every single hole, which gave you more towards the 51%. Um, with the the RV-10, the tail cone is part of the empennage. So with a quick build fuselage, you only get from the baggage bulkhead to the firewall, where an RV-7 was completely the entire tail to firewall. Um, so the RV-10 is not quite as critical on the 51%. Um, so. I, I believe that's one of the reasons why we were able to do the, the full-size holes. We may, we may be able to back that into other kits as well, but I'm not exactly sure um, if that's uh, going to be a limiting factor on quick build or not. So, I was uh, on suggestion of a lot of, of the other builders, is when you go through your plans, there's a section 5 where you, you really want to pay attention to that section five. Thankfully, I, I, I got the, the plans on the thumb drive ahead okay. of time. Yeah. And so I'm, even though I don't have the actual plans yet, I'm reading through section five yeah. ahead of time. And there's a portion in there that says the final size holes do not need to be deburred. Is it, does that hold true, or it, is it a good, still a good practice to deburr them? So I wouldn't say that's a, a true statement across the board. It depends on the individual parts. You know, if you take the blue vinyl off of the wing skin, you run your hand across it. If it doesn't, if you're not catching on each hole, then you need to. The holes themselves are okay. It still needs to be addressed around the perimeter. But if you uh, if you feel a burr on the holes, then you should still be deburring them. Okay, um, but it's a kind of a inspection uh, using best practices and, and common sense by the builder still to a certain extent. Okay, cool. Well, that's it for our tour. Thanks for taking along. And if you are thinking of building an, uh, an, any one of Van's aircraft RVs, yeah, uh, RV kits, then my builder number is down below. Van's will send me a hundred dollars just uh, as a thank you and it will go towards my own build, and it does not cost you one dime to say, hey, this guy referred me. So, and also, if you're a military member here, I'm I, sorry, I, I know this is it's a rule, but I got to. <laughs> if you're a military member, Vans Aircraft also has a military discount program, which I am, and I thank you very much, by the way, for that discount. 5% goes a long way on, on, uh, a, yeah, on a kit, because I mean, when we're talking about, you know, $50,000 air airframe, 5% goes a long way. It's like, what, uh, shoot, it's like 2,500 bucks, you know, if I'm doing the math right in my head. So that's it. Like, subscribe this video, and if you know anyone who is a, an av geek like us, share this video with them and have them also like and subscribe. And comment down below with any questions you have. I'll do, I'll do my best to address them in a future video or actually answer your comments. So this is Raymond signing out from Aurora, Oregon. Check six aviation, always check your six.